Hi. Okay, so I'm here again. Yes. So you have to uh, habilitate my share screen again. Uh, Professor Hu, sorry for uh, the problem, but I'm using another computer that. Uh, uh, That's it. Okay, okay. You can try now. Okay, okay, perfect. So here, uh, here my presentation. Uh, so first of all, let me introduce myself. Uh, I am Alessandro Pasuto. I am a research director at the uh, Research uh, Institute of Geohydrological Protection of the uh, Italian National Research Council. Uh, National Research Council is the biggest uh, research institution in Italy. And uh, since uh, 35 years, I'm working on, on landslide and geohazard assessment and mitigation. Especially, uh, I'm working on uh, landslide uh, monitoring and warning and risk management. Uh, so what I would like to uh, talk about uh, today is um, uh, a perspective, a Italian perspective of uh, disaster risk reduction uh, in order to share with you uh, our type of approach that we have in Italy, and then illustrate some a case of uh, a very high risk lens like that we are studying and monitoring since uh, almost uh, 30 years. Uh, because of the high risk uh, induced by uh, this type of phenomenon. So my presentation, uh, um, this is the outline of, of uh, uh, my presentation. And uh, sorry that, uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, you see, uh, I will uh, firstly introduce uh, some basic concept about uh, disaster risk reduction. And then I, I move to illustrate the Italian civil protection system that is uh, the core, the main actor of uh, DRR in Italy uh, is a very complex system that is um, uh, almost very uh, worldwide known uh, because of uh, is a permanent structure and we will see how it is organized. Uh, after that, uh, um, I, I would like to introduce you the main tool of disaster risk reduction in Italy. This is the uh, civil protection plan that each municipality uh, have to be uh, adopted, have to adopt. And, uh, and then uh, to illustrate uh, this case history of the Tessina landslide that is very, very famous landslide uh, in Europe because it's one of the largest landslides. Uh, affecting uh, some villages. Then I will move to uh, some final remarks. Uh, so, uh, uh, so I, 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 as for the basic competent, uh, concept, I would like to share with you a, a definition of a disaster risk. That is the likelihood of loss of life, injuries, or destruction and damage from a disaster uh, is generally speaking disaster in a given period of time. Um, I would like at the beginning of my presentation to stress about the terminology we use because it's very important to adopt a common terminology uh, because when we talk each other, um, I often experience the problem of uh, uh, speaking with colleagues from uh, other countries and uh, adopting different language is, is difficult to understand what we are speaking with. And so it's important to adopt a, a common terminology as in, in this framework, uh, the United Nations uh, Disaster Risk Reduction Offices uh, gave uh, a, a very good uh, documents, deliver very do good documents in which they explain the meaning of different words and, and the significance and the application of these different concepts. So uh, disaster risk is composed by two words. I mean, disaster, that is a, a serious disruption of functioning of a community or society that exceed the ability of the affected community to cope with it. 
So uh, when I, I, I'm suffering a, 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 in the, I mean, a natural hazard and I'm not able to cope and to face with this hazard, so this hazard can become a disaster for my society, for my community. So this is very important. Risk is, of course, the combination of the probability of an event and its negative uh, consequences. Uh, so what uh, disaster risk is uh, um, going to do is, uh, yes, to break the link between disaster and uh, uh, hazard and disaster. But uh, many, many uh, people are speaking about natural disaster. But natural disaster is um, a terminology uh, to be completely avoided because uh, a disaster is never natural. Yes, disaster often follows natural hazard, but uh, natural disaster is, uh, I mean, is an, a, a, a meaningful terminology. And so, because hazards are inevitable, uh, because hazards like uh, earthquake, uh, tsunamis, landslides, always happen and, and, and even in the future uh, we will have uh, earthquake and, uh, and disasters uh, related. But the disaster can be avoided by a good policies of prevention. So this is the key factor uh, that hazard is uh, unavoidable but disaster can be avoided. Uh, so uh, I would like to introduce the risk equation and of course the relative definition of the terms. Uh, so risk is, uh, uh, as you know, is given by hazard that is a dangerous phenomenon, is a physical phenomenon that can cause loss of life and uh, social economic disruption and environmental damage. Is a natural phenomenon, of course, like uh, uh, landslide, uh, earthquake, but also uh, chemical processes, industrial hazard, uh, man-made hazard. So there are different type of hazard. Uh, very recently, the there has been a working group of the United Nations that listed more than three hundred type of different hazard, and so uh, they deliver. A good documents in which uh, they explain what other are and they catalog different many many different type of hazard so it's a, a document that is available on the web and uh, hazard is one of the terms of this uh, product then we have exposure that is i mean people property or systems or other elements that can be potentially damaged uh, and then we have vulnerability, that is the characteristics of uh, circumstance of a community uh, that, is, that make it susceptible to be damaged. Uh, so we have these three type of uh, terms in causing risk. So if we want to reduce risk, we can, or, or we can reduce each of these three type of, uh, uh, of, of terms. I mean, hazard is not possible to reduce because hazard, as we already uh, know, uh, always happen. But we can uh, reduce uh, or, or, or make exposure equal to zero or vulnerability equal to zero. So the risk is related um, to the uh, environmental and uh, uh, social and economic uh, environment in which the hazard took place. If you consider, for instance, an earthquake, uh, this is, for instance, an earthquake, an earthquake uh, occurred in Wench One, um, sorry, uh, in, in Wench One in 2008. Uh, and uh, uh, magnitude eight and caused almost 70,000 victims. Uh, but if we move uh, some years before, uh, in, in 1957, and a network more or less similar, uh, magnitude 8.1, occurred in Mongolia, causing 30 victims. So you, it's easy to understand that in this type of environment, uh, each type of natural hazard 
because we are speaking about natural hazard, can cause very, very slow and uh, few damage. Uh, in, in this type of environment, many damage can be caused. And so the risk is very high in, in this sense. Uh, in Mongolia, of course, the type of risk related to natural hazard is very, very low. Uh, so uh, we have to be careful when we have when we spoke about high risk situations so on because the risk is related to the environment in which the hazard take place. Um, the, I mean, we we, we spoke about uh, uh, natural hazard and, and disaster risk since uh, uh, many years. I mean, there are three major steps in developing the, the philosophy of the disaster risk reduction. Uh, that is, uh, that are the, the, the main United Nations World Conference on Disaster Reduction. And as you can see, the first of, of, of this conference was, took place in, in Yokohama, Japan in 1999. And they, uh, at that time, they speak about natural, disa natural disaster. So they, I mean, the concept of disasters at that time was not so clear. Uh, then 10 years after, uh, in 2005, uh, even uh, in Japan, in, in Kobe, uh, the second World Conference on Disaster Reduction uh, took place. And so we were speaking about uh, resilience, building a resilience uh, communities uh, uh, to face with disasters. Uh, the last United Nations Conference took place in Sendai uh, in 2015. And so the full uh, concept of disaster risk reduction took place. And so this is a very important document uh, in which, uh, on which disaster risk reduction concept are based, is based. Uh, the four pillars, the four priority that uh, is um, uh, stressed by this, these um, documents are uh, understanding disaster risk, first of all, the knowledge uh, of the risk we are uh, facing in a local community is, is very important. Then strengthening disaster risk governance and management, uh, investing in disaster risk, and enhancing uh, disaster risk preparedness for effective response. So uh, here I, I put in green uh, two priorities that is uh, on our duties, uh, I mean, is um, I mean, when I say hazard, I send academics, uh, scientific institution, university research institution. So we we must support the development of uh, concept uh, and also the the uh, I mean the the, the awareness in, uh, among the population and uh, <clears throat> among the people affected by. Uh, natural hazard, and also to support uh, public administration, uh, engineering body, uh, civil protection to mitigate the risk of uh, uh, disasters. Uh, in blue, uh, there are two uh, of the uh, priority that is more political oriented. I mean, so is related to governance, to investments, and so on. But what we did is. Um, uh, what, what we have to do is to understand uh, uh, the hazard that we are facing with and enhancing the hazard and disaster preparedness uh, uh, for effective response. A key element of, of this uh, type of activity is, of course, improve the knowledge. And so the research on hazard in order to... <clears throat> Uh, in order to understand uh, the mechanics of the development of the different type of hazard, in order to uh, better face with, with them. Uh, then also detection, monitoring, and analyzing of the hazard uh, and possible consequencing, and also forecasting, I mean, uh, delineated uh, different scenarios that can be uh, in the futures. Dissemination and communication is very important. We have to bridge the gap between academics and, and civil society. So this is a very important point to stress. 
uh, we have to share our knowledge and to put our knowledge uh, in, in the civil society in order to improve the mitigation and the preparedness uh, of the community and the public administration. Of course, the preparedness at all level uh, to respond uh, to warning uh, and so on. So if we look at the disaster reduction, uh, risk reduction key actors, this is the disaster management circle. And we know that many, many people are involved in a, a disaster risk management, but <clears throat> education and scientific institution can help all the other actors that are involved in, in this, uh, in this framework, uh, starting from uh, rescue services, volunteers, NGOs, planners, uh, technical services, public administration, and so on. So uh, this is why I, I, I would like to, to stress this point that we have to uh, share our, uh, because we are producing knowledge and, and this knowledge uh, can be uh, exploited and uh, at serving the civil society. Uh, so now, as for the Italian perspective, uh, uh, the Italian civil protection system is one of, of the best uh, system in Europe, it's very, very well organized. And uh, um, difference, uh, differences for, uh, from other type of civil protection systems, like in France or uh, in Germany and so on, uh, Italian civil protection system is a permanent structure. Uh, it is not activated uh, only in case of emergency, like in other European countries. Uh, so it's a permanent structure that is working uh, 30, uh, 25 hours a day uh, and uh, is supporting uh, research activities in order to understand the disaster risk and, and the underlying hazard and so on. So, as you can see, uh, the main components of, of the systems uh, uh, include the scientific institutions. So my institute uh, is a, a consultant of civil protection, uh, is formally a consultant of civil protection since many, many years. So the components start from state administration, regional, provincial, municipality, public board, citizen, volunteers. Uh, we have almost 8,000, uh, 80,000 volunteers uh, in Italy that works uh, and make a trial uh, every month and, uh, and, is, and are dispatched in case of emergency all over the world. Uh, then we have some operating structures, and among them, there are a national group of scientific research that is a group of uh, scientists, um, experts in different types of fields. I mean, from geophysics, uh, uh, engineers, uh, uh, geologists, uh, uh, chemical engineers, and so on. Uh, they uh, make a, a very, they give a very strong support to civil protection. Then there are other uh, operating structures like uh, uh, fire department, voluntary services, arm, army, of course, forestry commission policies, and so on. Uh, we have very three different types of boards. I mean, the major risk national committee, I am a member of this committee, and is a, a very um, uh, uh, small group of um, scientists that uh, gave the, uh, the guideline for the disaster risk reduction. Then we have a national operative committee. And then also uh, from the administrative, we have uh, uh, different type of state, regional, uh, local administration that uh, jointly uh, face with the uh, disaster risk. Uh, as for the activity, of course, the, we have four type of activity, forecasting, prevention, emergency facing, and so emergency overcoming. So uh, with this type of activity uh, forecasting, of course, we have a, a very uh, strong network of monitoring systems in order to forecast uh, and monitor and survey in real time the hazard events. Then we have uh, uh, the prevention activity in order to reduce the damage. Uh, so we have alerts, uh, emergency planning, and so on. 
And during the emergency, we have, of course, the first aid intervention to support the affected population. And then in emergency overcoming all the initiative to return to normal uh, life. So as you can see, uh, the system is very uh, related to the administrative uh, structure of, of our country. That is uh, not so simple, I mean. So just to let you know some uh, different type of information. So Italy it, it has 20 regions. That is, uh, I mean, the biggest uh, uh, administration level uh, after, of course, the, the state uh, uh, administration. Then we have uh, more than 100 provinces. That is not like in China, it is, it is likely different. Uh, and then we have uh, almost 8,000 of municipality. That is the smallest, the smallest uh, structure, administrative structures. Uh, um, so each uh, ad type of administration has different rule in, in disaster risk reduction. Uh, so uh, if uh, an emergency occurs, uh, we have of course some intervention at national level, we have different type of board that is uh, take action. So if we have an earthquake or a, a very, very big floods uh, or a, I mean, a chemical uh, accident and so on that can affect all the national territory. So the national level is activated. Uh, but if we have a different type of hazard, like uh, floods or, or huge landslides, or also uh, small earthquakes, so we can, we can work at regional level. And so also at provincial level and a municipality level, we have different type of boards that are activated with respect to different type of hazard. And of course, different, different type of magnitude of hazard. What is important here is the, the national and regional functional center. So we have a, a, a network of center that is managing all the civil protection action. So in Italy, we have 20, uh, 21 regional functional center, each of one region. Uh, of course, is one more because uh, uh, Trentino Alto Agit, it is this uh, region has two different type of administration because of uh, the northernmost um, province of Italy is uh, <clears throat> German uh, language. And so it uh, uh, has different type of administration. And then we have a central functional center in Rome that coordinate all the regional functional center. That is uh, uh, the center that are able to activate uh, alert uh, in the local population to manage uh, uh, warning messages uh, uh, and so on. Uh, then we have uh, a, a, a coverage, uh, a radar coverage in order to forecast the meteorological events that can affect Italy. So you see here we have uh, all the national territory is completely covered by the, a, a meteorological radar. Uh, and then we have uh, uh, more than 4,500 monitoring station uh, that is composed by mainly hydrometer uh, just to uh, monitor the level of the rivers and then other type of sensors like wind, temperatures, snow depths. We have, of course, more than 3,000 rain gauges. Uh, and then we have uh, uh, each uh, of these uh, monitoring station is connected to a regional network. Uh, if we go into the detail in our home region, we are working in the northeastern part of Italy. This is the situation we have. Uh, this is a, a, a screenshot of uh, three days ago. Uh, we have uh, small uh, rain events. And so you see all the data. This is the precipitation. I mean, so the rainfall gauges, but we have all the data in real time. Uh, and all the people can uh, go and check uh, the data. Uh, this is the rainfall depth, uh, uh, the cumulative rainfall depth in 12 hours. Uh, so, but we have also wind, we have also uh, temperature, we have snow depth and so on. All the meteorological parameters are completely available in real time or quasi real time uh, for all the people interested in, in, in this. Um, then uh, we have uh, uh, one ha more than 130 hazard zones. So the Italian territory is split in different hazard zones that represent uh, 
a zone with homogeneously characteristics in, in, in related to type intensity and effect of the expected meteorological and hydrological events. Um, maybe you know, if you are not familiar with Italy, we have uh, uh, is a very mountain uh, area, very mountain country. So we have uh, a very big plain here in the northern part of Italy, but the rest of Italy is very, very um, had the morphology very, very uh, high and with steep slope. Uh, and in the southern part of Italy, we have volcanoes. Uh, we have in the central part, uh, we have very, very strong earthquake. Uh, and so, um, yes, is as for the natural hazard, we have very uh, important uh, structures. Um, then we have, uh, of course, uh, uh, here is the situation in our home region. We have seven uh, homogeneous, seven hazard zone. The three of them is the mountain hazard, uh, is the mountain zone, and then we have the play zone. Uh, so oh, each of these uh, operational center deliver the warning uh, systems uh, as soon as something occur in terms of uh, uh, rainfalls or uh, earthquake or, or other type of natural hazard. And, so, and then we have different type of alarm that uh, uh, is delivered by the National Functional Center. Uh, just for giving you a, an example of a very strong event that affected Italy in 2008, uh, we had a very, um, a very um, heavy thunderstorm uh, with uh, causing a lot of damage. Here is the meteor forecast of October 26th of uh, 2018. So you see here in the northern part of Italy, the rainfall expected was very high. Uh, then the day after, we had an orange alarm in, in many parts of the northern part of Italy and also in central Italy. Then moving uh, one day after in the red alarm, so we have uh, evacuation of uh, villages, uh, especially in the northern part. You see here in the northeastern part of Italy, we have very, very damage. Uh, and, and so this, is, this was the effect of, of that storm uh, that is called a via storm. And, what is important that was not so uh, common before was the strong wind that affected the, the forestry in the mountain side. You see here the effect of this of the wind that completely uh, fail entire forest. Uh, and uh, all the tree trunks uh, floating into the river and filling the uh, reservoir in, uh, uh, in the mountain areas. So uh, this, uh, in this case, uh, uh, our civil protection system was very, very stressed about this because it was an unexpected uh, phenomena. Uh, now we are studying this type of phenomena uh, and also this type of uh, effect, uh, uh, the type of effect of such uh, uh, strong wind phenomena. Um, so the main, the main tools that we have is the civil protection plan that is a very huge document that each municipality have to adopt in order to understand the type of risk that, are that they are facing and the type of action that they can uh, took in order to mitigate the, the, the risk. Uh, so each municipality, so almost 8,000 municipalities have to adopt uh, this type of documents that is uh, composed by a general part that includes the features of the territory uh, and the, the detailed analysis of hazard that this territory uh, can, can, can be affected by. And then we have a, a lining of lines of planning, so how to manage uh, uh, the rescue operation, uh, and also the interventional model, how to assign the decision, uh, making responsibility, uh, use of resources, the communication system, and so on. And so uh, the plan is designed to uh, assign uh, responsibility of the involved organization and individuals, of course, uh, but the main uh, responsible of the civil protection is the major of uh, the, uh, the municipality. Uh, so uh, I would like to give a very short uh, in, idea of what this plan contains. So we have different type of mapping. So this is a, an area of the municipality. It is a big city in the plain. So the main hazard is related to uh, floods 
or wildfires and so on, or, or also uh, industrial risk. So we have uh, a hydraulic risk map in which we um, we uh, map uh, all the uh, area with very uh, in which we can expect a very intensity uh, intensity uh, effect of uh, hydraulic risk like floods so we map all the element at risk like uh, roads uh, uh, public building like hospital schools uh, uh, and so on uh, then we have a seismic risk map and so even in this uh, is the red area is what the area that is most populated and so the area in, in which we can expect more damage to the people because it's more densely populated. Then we have the wildfire risk and even here we have uh, the red zone that is uh, a high risk areas because of uh, a combination of many uh, forestry and many trees and many important buildings and so on. Then we have industrial risk map in which we map all the industries that can be affected by accident and so all the, the industry that uh, treat uh, dangerous uh, materials and so on. Uh, and so uh, then we have all, uh, we map in, 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 this, uh, in this case, all the strategic structures like uh, railway, motorway, all the, the, the road that can be affected and can be damaged by different type of hazard and can be avoided during the type of, uh, during the hazard. And then also a planning a logistic map in which we map uh, area in which uh, concentrate the, the, the refugees and uh, where to install tent camp and so on like this one. This is a football, uh, a football playground in which is, uh, we can uh, install tents map to rescue the people. Uh, so now, uh, since the, the time is passing very fast, um, I, I, I pass to the, the, the last part of my presentation, which uh, I illustrate uh, the, uh, the case of the test in a landslide. Um, yes, uh, for, for all of you that are not familiar with Italy, we are here in Europe. Uh, so uh, our home region is the Veneto region, is in northwestern Italy. And here is the area you see Venice, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, and here is the, the, the area. You see Venice, a very famous uh, uh, city in the world. I mean, Padua is our uh, hometown in which we work. We are in, in the north part, northeastern part of Italy. It is close to the boundary with Austria, Slovenia, and Croatia. Uh, this is the, the phenomena uh, you see here is the, the landslide. It is a, a complex landslide uh, characterized by the roto translational movement in the source area and, uh, uh, and then uh, in the flow, uh, head flow and mud flow in, 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 along the channel. The point is that there are two uh, villages that is very, very close to the, to the area affected by landslide that can be uh, severe, uh, severe damaged by, by by the landslide. Uh, here is the evolution. The landslide uh, triggered by was triggered by um, a, a road construction in the upper part of a, a forestry road uh, construction in the upper part of the source area. And you see the during here is is evolved very fast. In 1992, we had. Uh, a, a, a react, an activation of, of the uh, eastern part of the landslide. And now it is the situation. And you see the two villages that is very, very close to, 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 to the area, uh, to the flow area. Uh, here is the, the source area uh, in 1992 uh, during the first reactive, strong reactivation. It is the situation now. You see a completely devastated area. Um, we have, uh, uh, as for the geological point of view, we have uh, a flash formation that is an alternance of, uh, um, of sandstones and Mars and a very thick layer of uh, morainic deposits. So it's very, very um, poor material. Uh, you see here uh, from um, some uh, 
some photos of the situation. Here, the flow that is uh, uh, close to affect the village. Uh, you have to consider that this valley was uh, 60 meter depth uh, before 1960. And now it's completely filled of material that is uh, very close to overflowing and affecting the, the, the village. Uh, you see here the material that was flowing down uh, and, and here uh, the village of Funes that was uh, uh, protected by uh, artificial uh, and uh, war engineering wall in order to uh, avoid the overflow of the of the of the material here and you see other view very very this flow was very fast several meters per day and, and so uh, during uh, different period we uh, have to be evacuated uh, to uh, the, this village. Uh, and then uh, you see here an overflow in another uh, little valley. And, and in the lower part, uh, we have another village that is the, the I mean, the, the, the main village of the area. Uh, and so we built a, 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 as a countermeasure work, we built this type of liquefaction uh, plants in order to avoid the, the accumulation of, of, of the material in, in connecting with the, with the village in order to avoid the overflowing. And then also we built a, a, a drainage tunnel here on the upper part of the uh, landslide in order to avoid the, the water infiltration in, in the source area. It is the, the, the tunnel is 1.2 kilometers long drainage tunnel that is draining uh, even now. We also install an, a monitoring and alarm system that uh, we split in two parts. Uh, the first part is for monitoring the displacement of the source area uh, in order to give a, an alert. Uh, and then the second part is a, a, an alarm system that was uh, built along the channel in order to detect the flow, the health flow that uh, uh, running uh, uh, along the channel down the board down the valley. Uh, um, then we, this is part of our instrumentation. It, this was the first time we test uh, the ground-based SAR. It was one of the first ground-based SAR uh, in Italy. And uh, uh, now we are still working with this type of instrument in different type of uh, landslides. And uh, we, uh, just to illustrate you, uh, this is the optical images of the ground-based SAR and the ground-based SAR images. And we, uh, this is what we obtained. Uh, you see, we highlight the um, more uh, active uh, areas in order to give uh, the alarm uh, of the population in case of, of sudden uh, alarm. In, two in sudden movements. In 2018, we have a, a another reactivation of this, this sector uh, that was very, very critical. And you see here, uh, we had a, a first survey uh, on 18th of uh, April, and we come back three days after, and this was the situation. We have a very strong movements in three days. And so all these materials flow down into the channel and, uh, and and so, but unfortunately, uh, this reactivation uh, didn't give uh, important uh, effect on, on, on along the channel and on the uh, villages. Uh, what we do since many many years is a, a GN, GSSN and topographic network survey. So this is the vector of displacement. Uh, you see the uh, we have displacement of uh, several meters per year in the main active part, uh, but also we had some problem in the main part in the town in La Mosano village uh, that is affected by another landslide. And so here we had the uh, GPS systems uh, and uh, topographic systems that monitoring uh, real time. Of course, the the movement are very very slow with respect to the to the to the first one but here we had a lot of houses that is moving uh, with the landslide just to give you an idea of the situation of this area uh, we uh, did many different 
uh, uh, we apply many different numerical models in order to forecast the evolution of this of this landslide and uh, find out some possible mitigation measure. We also use cellular automata in order to uh, um, define different type of scenarios, considering uh, the collapse uh, of uh, 500,000 of cubic meters, 1 million or 5 million of cubic meters, and so to see the effect on the village. On such base, uh, we uh, map uh, the element at risk in case of emergency. And so you see here the red houses was the houses that can be affected by possible overflow of the, uh, of the landslide. Uh, and so after that, uh, um, just to put everything into the civil protection plan, we uh, set up uh, uh, safe areas for new settlements. Uh, when the people are evacuated. So these are the areas in which we install tent camps or uh, other type of facilities. Uh, so the civil protection plan, uh, I mean, as I told you before, is uh, uh, the, the main documents at municipality level. But what I would like to uh, to show you here is the structures of uh, the plan, uh, but what is important is uh, uh, what how this plan is working now. Um, we uh, had uh, two different type of scenarios: a, a quasi-static evolution of the landslide. So in this case, uh, if there is an, a reactivation, uh, the person in charge of, of survey uh, keeps in touch with the uh, with the commission that is uh, that is activated and checking the efficiency of the monitoring system. So we are managing the monitoring system in, in this area, and so in case of reactivation, we are called uh, to um, uh, provide a checking of the efficiency of the monitoring system and the data of the monitoring system. If uh, uh, we have a slow dynamic evolution, and so the, 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 the activation uh, accelerate uh, the rate of movement, so uh, we increase the checkup uh, frequency of the, the different type of um, sensors. So, uh, and we activate an alarm procedures in case uh, of need. Uh, so we, uh, the, level, the level of alert increase. In case of fast dynamic evolution, uh, of course, um, we give an alert um, of the population and, uh, and also of the commission, the safety commission. Uh, and, and so we start to monitor in continuous uh, uh, and very, very frequently the, the movements. And then if uh, uh, the people that is in charge of uh, survey uh, check uh, that the movement uh, overpass some threshold, so give an alarm to the population. And so the major activate uh, all the structures uh, that uh, have to govern the emergency. So the emergency phase are triggered. And of course, in case of imminent risk, after consultants with the major will activate the procedure, the evacuation procedures, and uh, uh, we arrived at the evacuation. So all the people are uh, take out from the house and put on the safe areas. And, and so we wait until the situation uh, will come back uh, in, in a slow dynamic evolution or a quasi static dynamic evolution. So all the people are out of a house and uh, uh, the major is the only people that can declare that the evacuation is overpassed and the people can uh, come back to, uh, to, how our, to their house. So uh, going to the final remarks, uh, um, I, I just uh, synthesize here uh, some concepts that I would like to, um, to give in your mind at the end of my presentation. Uh, so uh, um, knowledge and education is uh, a key element in which to invest in order to uh, uh, reduct, reduct the disaster risk. Because as I used to say, uh, people aware of natural hazard are generally less vulnerable. So the people who knows is the people who can suffer less than the other. 
Uh, as we say uh, before, the uh, main three goals of Sendai framework uh, of action are preventing uh, the creation of risk, reduction of existing risk, and strengthening uh, resilience of the people and assets. Uh, policies and practices for disaster risk reduction should be based on understanding the disaster risk. So this is our role. Our core business is this, understanding the disaster risk and all its aspects, starting with hazard, vulnerability, and exposure. Uh, we are, of course, as I already said, we are knowledge producer. And the main goal of our actions be the face safety of the population at risk. And there, therefore, we must stress on the concept of living with risk. That is important because we know that is uh, living equal zero uh, is is not uh, is a nonsense uh, because we are uh, at risk every time every day uh, everywhere we are uh, so we are to to learn to living with risk and it is of paramount importance the full engagement of all institutions from the state institution uh, at the national local level, as well as the stakeholders and users and all the components of civil society. And uh, of course, the integration of different types of actions, as well as different types of instrumentation, is of paramount importance in building a reliable protection system and a resilient society. So is this is, I mean, some key points that is important at each type of level. It's important to understand that uh, if we do not take action in this direction, uh, even small hazard can cause a very high damage, it can cause very high risk. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, I'm very sorry for, for the length of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Pasudo. Very uh, interesting uh, lecture uh, and, uh, and uh, the uh, introduction of the uh, R, uh, DRR uh, policies and practice uh, in Italy have been uh... Yes, I, I lost Professor Hu. Hello? Hey. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, now we come to the Q and A section. Uh, is there any questions? Uh, anyway, I am available. I mean, uh, I, I will give. Um, um, there was uh, my email address uh, in, in the uh, in the last sli slide, but uh, all my. Um, main uh, features of uh, everybody can contact me in any time if they want some more support, some, I mean, everything is they need, I, I am able to, to be in touch with all of, uh, with all of them. So uh, I'm completely available. Yes, uh, we have two uh, uh, online platforms uh, uh, on the uh, Tencent uh, meeting uh, platform. We also have many uh, Chinese participant. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any questions? Everything okay. Here, so. uh, yeah, I, I don't like uh, Professor uh, Pasudu. I, I, I'm very interested in the, in, uh, the uh, monitoring, monitoring part uh, of the uh, landslides and other uh, geohazards. Uh, do you have any uh, experience uh, related to uh, uh, underground monitoring? Uh, just now you have mentioned uh, many work, work, works have been done uh, uh, concerning uh, the, uh, the surface of the landslide. Yeah. Uh, you have used a ground-based ground -based SAR to monitor the, the movements, right? Yes, yes. Um, I mean, uh, of course, uh, I am not uh, um, explain everything, but uh, at the beginning of the, our study in that area, we installed uh, um, 
on the boreal in clinometers, uh, uh, groundwater level variation sensors. Uh, uh, then we install also uh, underground sensors uh, in order to detect uh, the movements on the upper part. But uh, this type of sensor was uh, uh, put in, uh, um, out of work in, in several weeks. So um, it was very, very expensive. Uh, yeah. But uh, he, 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 as, uh, if you if you remember in the Lamozano downtown where we have the village that is moving in in that uh, area we had uh, many boreals that is completely instrumented by fixed uh, inclinometric probes um, we have uh, extensometers uh, we have uh, crack meters uh, on the buildings uh, uh, we have many many sensors that is uh, checking the movement of the building. Uh, the bell tower, for instance, is in the main uh, square of the of the of the village. So we are monitoring this, uh, and and then we have a, a, a topographic system that is measuring in continuous. Uh, we have in, in that area we have almost fifty benchmarks in, in old buildings and main uh, structures like bridges and so on, and, and so we are taking a measurement every four hours uh, of the movements with a, in a total station. Uh, so we have a, a continuous monitoring. Uh, of course, this type of monitoring instrumentation have to be used in, in, in no so fast lens light like the Tessna lens light that moving some meters uh, uh, per year. Uh, so uh, in case of Lamozano lens lights and the other lens light that affected the village, uh, in, completely the village, uh, we are installing a, a very um, good network of instruments, uh, uh, sufficient instruments, uh, also in-depth instrumentation for measuring the, the groundwater level, because now we are working on a drainage uh, tunnel. And so we are now understanding how the groundwater uh, pattern is developing uh, underground. And so we are making uh, now a very strong job on, on understanding the groundwater pattern. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, uh, with the development uh, of the uh, remote sensing technologies, I think the, the measurement uh, accuracy uh, and uh, uh, the, re the resolution have been improved greatly in recent years. Uh, we, we, we have developed uh, the INSA. Now in China, where many, uh, at many sites, we, we use INSA to monitor the surf, surface displacement uh, and the ground-based SAR. And uh, uh, drone, we, we have all, all uh, in, in many cases, we, we will use a drone to, to scan yeah. the, the, the ground surface. Yeah, but for underground, uh, underground uh, the parameters are very hard to, to detect in China. Uh, as you have mentioned, uh, many uh, creeping landslides will have very large movement every year. So when we install the inclinometer uh, in, in the borehole, uh, it will, will, will be damaged uh, maybe uh, several months later or, or half a year. So it, it, that's, that, that's a, a big problem uh, for, for our instrumentation. Uh, another problem is for groundwater. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in uh, the Three Gorges uh, Dam area, uh, we have uh, uh, measured uh, many landslides, but uh, uh, the, the land, landslide, most of the landslides were triggered by uh, rainfall uh, and, the, uh, and the water uh, fluctuation. But uh, it's very hard for us to uh, monitor the, the, the movement of the uh, groundwater level. Um, and, uh, for many uh, sensors, uh, the data are not very stable. So that, that's also a big problem. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, th now there is a, a great development of the remote sensing technique, but there is a very uh, strong risk uh, in, in this development that the people make everything standing in, in sit down in your office without <laughs> walking in yeah. the field. Uh, so yeah. it's, it is a, a very serious risk for, I mean, for geologists, but also for engineers, for all the people who is working on landslide. The people have to walk on the field and, and to sure. check what's happening in the ground. And also all the measurements taken by remote sensing technique have to be validated. 
Uh, and this is important a uh, question because uh, uh, we we are not uh, able uh, to use uh, uh, all the data coming from remote sensing technique without uh, any validation ground point. Uh, so this is a very uh, important point to stress. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Is there any other question? Professor Yu, are you there? Luca? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I know you have developed a very uh, accurate uh, earth spray cells. Can they be used in uh, landslide monitoring? Yeah, actually, um, we developed a, a couple of uh, pressure sensors that uh, may be used for solid pressure measurement. Uh, one thing that uh, uh, it's important to, to consider is that uh, uh, this kind of sensor um, having very high sensitivity usually don't have uh, uh, that much uh, uh, range. So uh, in order to be developed for, uh, in order to be installed for, for, for example, landslide monitoring, we should tune the characteristic of the sensor uh, in order to match the range that we expect for the pressure range. Uh, this is because uh, the pressure that we have developed are targeting a particular application that is the monitoring dikes and embankments in which the pressure that uh, we are expected to measure are not at large. In any case, uh, um, uh, the, the, the sensor that we uh, have developed uh, allow for uh, quite large uh, tuning. So uh, in principle, it is, it is possible. Um, one thing that's important to consider for this kind of sensor is uh, uh, the choice of the proper um, uh, filter in order to, to be matched with the soil property. So um, once uh, we define the correct uh, uh, filter characteristic, we, we can apply those filters to the, the sensor that we have developed and deploy also for, for land light monitoring. Uh, what we observe in particular is that uh, uh, the better approach is to use, uh, uh, let's say, FPG-based uh, pressure sensor. So sensor, um, uh, that are based on a single point uh, technology for fiber optics. Still, there is a quite large uh, interest also in the other kind of uh, pressure sensor that can be used that are based on um, distributed uh, technologies. But uh, as far as uh, we know at the moment, there are no commercial products uh, able to perform uh, distributed pressure measurement. Even if uh, we are working on that, and I hope that uh, I could give some uh, uh, hints and some uh, 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 direction in the talk that I'm going to be to give uh, uh, the next week. If I can uh, add something more, um, we, we in, Professor, you you mentioned in your presentation last week uh, the I mean this recent technique that is the DAS. I mean the distributed acoustic sensing that is very yeah. very important. I mean so now we also uh, are working <laughs> on this uh, type of technique. Oh, great. Uh, it is very That's promising. very hard. <laughs> uh, yeah. It is very promising for, for my point of view that I'm a geologist because so I, I mean, I, I am a, a, I mean, a user of this type of instrument. So uh, I also, I always stress Luca in order, I say, I, I need this type of sensor, please think about. Uh, <laughs> so uh, this is uh, what I'm do this. Uh, now, uh, but uh, it's important because, for instance, in case of debris flow, uh, we uh, we make some uh, some experience in the application of of, of uh, acoustic sensing that is very promising because it's important in case of so fast uh, landslide like debris flow. 
uh, have a, a detection possibility to understand the development of this type of phenomena and also hopefully the characteristics of, of the material in terms of uh, i mean uh, grain size or water content and so on uh, so uh, i i hope that we we on this on this type of sensor that could be very very useful mm, yeah yeah yes. Luca. Uh, about that, uh, I will uh, I will uh, introduce some uh, of uh, our results that we obtain on uh, uh, artificial flume about uh, application of uh, the AS uh, to debris flow monitoring. So next week we will see some first results yeah. of our experience. I mean, so Luca will introduce this. On that, yeah, yeah, we look forward to it. Uh, actually, in China, uh, we have just. Uh, install uh, the the DA DAS, the DAS cables mm -hmm. into a, a borehole of uh, 3000 meters depth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, we have successfully detect uh, some some interesting issues such such as uh, the the nearby earthquake. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we also detect some uh, human activities uh, on the uh, ground surface because uh, there is a, a mining uh, mining project uh, nearby, uh, about uh, three uh, kilometers uh, far away from, from the borehole. Uh, but uh, the, because the uh, data is huge, uh, so yeah. we need to uh, use a very uh, powerful computer to analyze the data. And uh, we, all, we co cooperate with the uh, experts of uh, geophysics because they have yeah. very for computation uh, skills. Yeah, we are doing this. Uh, yeah, actually, DAS is, uh, uh, as uh, already said, it is really promising uh, because uh, um, it can replace or integrate uh, geophone arrays, but uh, uh, multiplying the number of sensing points. So assuming that you're, you are collecting data at uh, 100 hertz or even one kilohertz, the amount of data that uh, are produced by this, uh, this kind of system, you have to think about uh, some kilometer long uh, cable uh, with uh, at least uh, a spatial resolution of two or five meters. So the amount of sensing points is extremely huge and the data rate is extremely large. So um, performing real time uh, data analysis is almost impossible at the moment, even if there are people that are trying to, to uh, include the uh, machine learning and uh, other uh, artificial yeah, intelligence yeah. Uh, procedure in the data analysis. Um, as far as so, uh, the, the, the performance of the, of the sensing system, to be honest, uh, I mean, uh, the sensitivity and the signal to noise ratio is a little bit worse than compared to a jail phone, if one consider one single point. But the real uh, powerful aspect of this technique is the amount of points that you can collect. Even so, uh, I mean, uh, once you get the raw data, it's really, really tough to look into the meaning of the data unless you have specific knowledge on the ground. And uh, I mean, uh, I think you, you, you did right. I mean, you need the, the, uh, the, the, the support of people that do seismic uh, perspective uh, analysis in order to look at what is inside those data, because it's really, really tough to, to understand exactly what is going on, just looking at the raw data uh, itself. Even so, I think that uh, uh, I mean, uh, DAS is, is increasing uh, its popularity because uh, it's really, really a, a breakthrough technology in the, in the scenario. Um, looking at the technology platform itself, uh, it is born as a dynamic uh, um, uh, sensing platform, but uh, nowadays a lot of uh, commercial producers are, are uh, providing uh, interrogators that are really, really stable. So we are lowering the uh, lower frequency up to few, uh, um, uh, I mean, a fraction of, of her. So it's uh, getting more and more interesting also for, uh, let me say, almost static uh, application. So in the next few years, I, I expect a lot of growing interest in, in this kind of technology, even if it's quite expensive, to be honest. <laughs> yes. yes. Thank you, thank you, Luca. And uh, thank you, Professor uh, Pasto. Uh, I think now uh, we, we come to the end of this presentation. Uh, 
thanks for giving us uh, such uh, 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 um, wonderful uh, lecture. Thank you, and uh, yes, see you next welcome. time. And hope to stay in touch with, with you. And so we continue the discussion in the next in the next weeks about this sure. type of instruments, of course. And uh, thank you very much for all the people attending the seminars. And uh, I hope to meet uh, some of them very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <clears throat> OK, now uh, we come to uh, the second uh, lecture. Uh, this lecture will be given by uh, Professor uh, Antina. Uh, Professor Antina is, uh, have, have, have you been there? Hello? Hello? Hello, Professor Antia. Yes, I'm right here. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay, I'm right Hi, here. Hello, I have seen you. Uh, Calabar, Nigeria. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, what, what time is, is it uh, in your country? Uh, it's 10 after 10 now. Oh, 10 after oh, 9, 10 right? After. 10 after 9. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, let me uh, briefly introduce uh, uh, Professor uh, Antia. Uh, Professor Antia is uh, uh, an expert uh, of uh, uh, geotechnical engineering uh, and geo environment engineering. Uh, he is uh, uh, vice president of ISDG, International Society of uh, uh, Environmental Te Te Technology. Uh, and uh, he re represent uh, the Africa uh, and uh, he support our society very much uh, today. Uh, we are very honored to invite honored to invite him to give us a lecture. Uh, Professor Antia, can you uh, yeah, share okay, your screen you. now? Yeah. 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 Okay. Ready? Yes. Please share the screen. Oh yeah. Okay, I'm ready. Oh, that, that's great. That's great. So can I get started? Yeah, please start. All right. So thank you, everybody. Um, um, I'm greeting you here from Calabar in Nigeria, West Africa. It's really a pleasure to be part and parcel of this webinar series, and I'm talking to you today on the imperatives of coastal hazard contingency planning for East Africa in support of marine transportation activities of the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, on this screen here, it's a, it's a vessel that I'm very emotional about because uh, about 30 years ago, I commenced my career research on the North Sea um, using this vessel. So it would just be appropriate if I can dedicate this presentation to the captain and the crew who supported my research for a number of years on this vessel in Germany. Now, for the presentation itself, I'll be looking at uh, the following as outline, uh, premise and rationale for the presentation, and then uh, factors and considerations for pollution hazards, vis-a-vis -vis contingency planning. Then we'll look at the case study, which is the East African coastal sector. And then of course, finally, we'll attempt some recommendations and then for conclusions. Now, um, this few slides is probably quite familiar, but I'm bringing it in here just to remind us uh, about the initiative itself. Um, you see here you have the marine transport routes, which uh, has a major hub in Kenya, East Africa. And so um, looking at this segment of the coastal environment of East Africa is uh, what we'll be looking at, as a matter of fact. And uh, it's up to 3,000 to 5,000 kilometers stretch, depending on whether you're looking at the many islands that's uh, off the coast. 
But whatever the case, it's, it's a very important uh, area. Now, regarding the premise, um, we all will understand that the probability of accidental discharge of pollutants to cause so that in the marine environment would definitely increase with the volume of vessel traffic. I mean, it's, it's a logical thing to do or to think about. But most importantly, uh, we know that the coastal and marine environments are very vulnerable, especially to uncontrolled discharge of pollutants on account of a number of reasons. One, the complex hydrodynamic conditions. Number two, the fragile ecosystems or ecohabitats. And then the rich biodiversity. And of course, very importantly, human life that may be exposed to the impact of such pollutants concomitant with the fact that uh, a, lot of, a lot of people end their livelihood from the coastal resources. Now, this is uh, globally well known, but it's, uh, East Africa is even more accentuated because of the high dependence of the uh, maritime states on both the living and non-living resources. And so, uh, obviously, we'll understand that is justification for anxieties, especially when you begin to have an upsurge in vessel traffic related pollution incidents, which might 